Okay, thank you so much everyone for joining us. We're really um, pleased to be presenting this event at WeWork. So this is our first Facebook Live event that we're doing. So at the back there, we're actually streaming this live um, to everywhere and also to our partners, the Asia Law Network in Singapore. So we'll be trending in Singapore as well, which is um, fantastic. So um, tonight, obviously the event, as you would all be aware, is about the gig economy. And so we have brought together three of the amazing Legally Yours lawyers that we work with um, tonight, and I'll get them to introduce themselves. And we've also very lucky to have a special guest, Linda, from the Fair Work Ombudsman as well. So thank you for joining us, panellists. Um, before I actually hand it over to them for an introduction, I thought it might be useful um, for me to let you know a little bit about Legally Yours. Um, so what we are is we are an automated online platform that connects clients to fixed fee lawyers. And so we have lawyers, such as the lawyers that I've got here next to me, um, that all do fixed fee. And so we've, we've spent a lot of time in the community saying, you know, what is it that prevents people from approaching lawyers? And the biggest two factors was bill shock, because people never know what they're gonna pay. And the second one was they never know where to go. And um, one of the things that we battle a lot with in the legal industry is negative referrals, where you know, you'll know you say to your friend, oh, I need a lawyer, and they'll say, well, don't go to that one. And it's, it's just not good enough. So what we've done at Legally Yours is we have found all of the amazing fixed fee lawyers, such as the lawyers we have here tonight, with great communication skills. They care about their clients. Um, they're all about fixed fee. And you can hop on our platform at legallyyours.com.au and you can actually connect with those lawyers via two ways. So we've got a quick match function, which is for those of you that might just have a, a bit of a legal query, even if it's, do I have a legal problem or I've got an employment contract and I just need to get this clause figured out or you know any kind of little query. And you can request a quick match call with one of our lawyers for $49 and they'll call you on the phone and have that chat with you. And then also, if you're ready to go ahead with a legal service, that's when you can request a fixed fee quote. Um, and as I've mentioned, we only deal with lawyers that are fixed fee, so you'll always know upfront exactly what you're going to pay. So um, on your chairs, you've got some little quick match cards, so we'd encourage you to take those um, because you never know if someone's going to ask you for a referral to a lawyer and you can actually pass them the card, which would be brilliant. Um, so enough about Legally Yours. I'm going to um, hand over to the panellists tonight to just give a really quick introduction. Uh, hi, I'm Luke Connolly uh, from Connolly Workplace Law, and uh, I've been in industrial relations employment for 20 years. Uh, came from Clayton Newts and Freehills, and then got sick of uh, the big sausage factory mentality. and. Uh, Essentially, because my clients drove it, they said they were sick of uh, the high fees and the lack of creativity in billing, and so it was a no-brainer really for me. And it's been uh, since 2013, and it's gone from strength to strength, and jumped on legally yours, and I'm really enjoying this real push for um, new law. Uh, it's very exciting. Got my own. Hi, my name's Anthony Curtin. I'm from Merton Lawyers. Uh, I'm our firm works in corporate property and litigation and private clients. Uh, we do a, a number of, uh, we work with a number of tech and uh, startups, um, everything from MVP stage all the way to quite established and looking at IPOs. Um, I've, my background, I was in Sydney as a corporate lawyer with Ashurst for a long time. Uh, I went out on my own and started a number of startups, some that worked, um, some that didn't work, um, and some that have um, yeah, still got and still operate. And I think it's really very relevant tonight because however many years ago, uh, the gig economy would have been um, something that we would have really leveraged off. And um, fortunately today we do, and hopefully we're gonna have a bit of a chat about that tonight. Thanks. Thanks guys, uh, Rob Rankin, Rankin Business Lawyers is my firm. We're a uh, Australia wide team or Eastern Seaboard, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Um, our firm's a little bit different in that we run a virtual workplace. Uh, our lawyers uh, work from around the traps, co-working spaces, out at our client's office, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, like uh, you know, uh, the other lawyers on the panel, I think we've all been you know, seen your roles in uh, large traditional firms and just seen a better way of, of working with our clients and uh, yeah, you know, legally yours, another way to leverage uh, those opportunities. 
Thank you very much. I'm Linda McAllary Smith. I'm the Executive Director of Compliance and Enforcement with the Fair Work Ombudsman, which is Australia's workplace regulator. And for those of you watching from Singapore, it's equivalent sort of to the Ministry for Manpower in Singapore. So our job is to educate employees and businesses throughout Australia on what workplace entitlements are, how people should be treated in the workplace. Um, we like to invest in helping people get it right in the first place, so understanding what your rights are, but also making sure you're paying your employees correctly and doing that right. Um, we also have a role in investigating instances of non-compliance and take litigation against uh, organisations who have been non-compliant with the law in, in very serious circumstances. The way that I normally put it is we, we take around half a million phone calls from people um, across the country every year. Um, we get over 16 million visits to our website, fairwork.gov.au, and we litigate around between 30 to 50 uh, matters each year. So you have to try really hard to be in the bucket that we put into court. Um, so I, I'm very supportive of all of you being engaged in questions around emerging trends in the law and being on the, the front foot, both from your own perhaps business perspective or from an advisor perspective. Um, the cost of non-compliance is always far greater than the cost of complying, even though it might not feel like that at the time. So thank you. Awesome. Back. Thank yep. you. So don't be scared of Linda. She's um, she's amazing. <laughs> I'll let you in. So you know she's known as the enforcer, but she's the smiling she's the smiling enforcer. So it's great to have have you all here with us. So thank you for joining us. So um, we will have a question time at the end. So please keep your questions to the end, unless it's something that you just need to ask at the time. But we we want to make sure that we get this sort of done and dusted, and everyone has a good opportunity to ask those questions at the end. So to open up the discussion, first of all, I guess it's important. It's it's actually been really interesting this whole week. I've had a lot of people saying to me, well, what is the gig economy? So, um, you know, obviously in this room, we're all pretty um, au fait with it, given that we're here and we want to know more about it. But um, I thought it might be helpful to the wider audience that are watching us um, live today to just give a little definition of what the gig economy is. So essentially, it's an economic model which employs temp or flexible jobs as the norm and where companies hire contractors for not on-demand work. So basically they don't receive salaries but rather they get paid for the gigs or the services that they provide. And obviously this is a fairly new phenomenon but what it's done I guess and, and we'll talk a bit more about this as we go along the panel but it's really changing the way um, people, the way businesses operate and the way people get employed in the labour market. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting topic and, um, you know, certainly from the government's perspective, Linda will talk a little bit about how, you know, they're sort of playing probably a little bit of catch up and trying to get an understanding of, um, you know, how it should be. I, I think um, there are a lot of positives of the gig economy, but there are also some negatives that we need to obviously bear in mind as well. So to open up the discussion, I thought Luke might be able to um, talk a little bit about the gig economy from his perspective. Um, and I think you've got a particular slant on startups and, and how they can protect themselves. Yep. Um, so I think uh, importantly, if you're starting up, you need to really be looking at the type of relationship you want in the organisation with your staff. Um, and that isn't always just what you choose, it's what and how the work uh, is and what your model is, because it's from your model that you'll determine uh, when the law will help you do that, uh, as to what model um, uh, one fits best for your organisation, that's really at the end of the day your choice, but then you need to make sure is that model that I choose, and by that I mean essentially co contractor or employee, is that model going to work, is it legal? Um, and there's a number of things you need to consider as to whether it's legal. Uh, there's a number of tests. Uh, and in the gig economy, um, the, the courts and tribunals are struggling with uh, having the traditional employment contractor tests keep up with the gig economy, given the gig economy um, is using labour in a, in a new and futuristic way. So uh, the courts and tribunals are battling and there's a number of decisions. There's been a couple of Uber decisions where the Uber drivers are found to be contractors but not, not easily and not without the commissioners um, gritting their teeth over it. So it's not going to be long before maybe one goes the other way. But it's important to get the relationship right because um, we have Linda down the end here who's with the scary Fair Work Ombudsman and if you get it wrong, um, then they may come a-knocking. 
and if they come a knocking, watch out. So um, there's fairly hefty fines, although in fairness to Linda, they do look at um, the proactive and, uh, and trying to fix it and, uh, and work with you on it rather than just go and penalise you. Uh, so get it right, because if you get it right, there's a lot of benefits of particular relationships. With a contractor relationship, you are excused from a lot of the employment obligations in terms of leave obligations and those sort of on costs. So um, get that right and then, and then you can sort of put your business strategies into place. You need to think about things like, do I need something in writing now? Yes, you do. I can't, I can't impress upon that you enough and I'm sure my colleagues would agree. Don't rush off and think this is all exciting and I've got all my mates on board and we'll never have a dispute. Yes, you will. Um, you'll have a dispute with your best mate in business uh, and if you haven't got something in writing the first thing we'll ask for is what have you got in writing and um, it's so frustrating when there's nothing because oh well, we're mates so it was just a handshake and we'll fix it later that won't work and it's really important with startups because you've got things like IP new ideas um, you've got things like inventions and it's all exciting you know look what we're creating but you know we only have to watch the Facebook movie and see what happened there as to not having something in writing and the zillions of dollars that were handed over to the two twins, wasn't it, or the twins in that. So, yeah, you've got to get it right. You've got to make sure it's compliant and make sure that you've got everything in place um, so that um, you protect your IP, you protect your confidentiality of information, you protect your trademarks uh, and all that sort of stuff. And also, importantly, your shares. You know, who owns the business? Mm. Uh, have you got share plans in place? Because, again, um, the Facebook example is... Um, who owns the business and we have to pay, make a huge payout to someone who says, well, it was my idea to start with. Well, what does the document say? So invest, sound like I'm selling myself and my <laughs> colleagues, but invest, invest in the legals early because it'll bite you on the backside yeah. if you don't. But I'll hand it over to my colleagues. Well, I'm probably rambling one, on. One question, Luke, before I hand you over to Anthony. But um, I was just interested, so OH&S, have yeah. you got any information on how that kind of plays a role in, in relation to these? Well, yeah. yep. So OHS is important and it's often forgotten. Uh, with the gig economy you've got, and I was just talking to my colleagues before we started, with the gig economy you've got uh, staff, I won't call them uh, employees, they may not be, um, but you've got your staff and they could be working anywhere, often from home or in a Starbucks or on a plane or wherever. All of those places are your office if you're the boss. You've got to make sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong wherever they are, particularly in the gig economy where your office is virtual, what are you doing to make sure you've got policies and procedures in place or you'll have someone just as nasty as the Fairwick Ombudsman banging on your door and that's work cover and they're pretty nasty. So uh, make sure you've got your systems, your policies, your procedures, your work from home policies in place. Again, you might rush off with your big idea and think we're going to make millions and forget about all these things. But again, they'll bite you on the backside if you haven't got them uh, in place at the start. Yep. So very, very important OH&S. And, &S. and uh, you know, getting electrocuted by your, your toaster while you're going to have a coffee break. You know, have you have you gone and gone to um, your 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 staff's house to check that their uh, workspace is safe? You must do that from an OHS perspective in the gig economy, or you'll be prosecuted potentially. Yep. Yeah. So that that's really interesting and quite valuable information because I certainly you know hadn't thought about OHS as something in there. So it's something we need to to really um, think about. And just a shout out to anyone from WorkCover. Um, I don't think you're that scary. Um, anyway, we, hello, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> um, so Anthony, we might move across to you. Um, so I know you were keen to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities um, and the way that um, you know people sometimes might take advantage. So put a bit of a, a positive spin on, on the gig economy. Yeah, um, I, I mean, just back to what, uh, just a general comment on Luke's um, comment there was around getting your documents in place. I think as well as entrepreneurs or founders of businesses, I think it is really important to do that just because once it does kick in, once you've got work cover on your back, once you've got a dispute with you, it, it's, there is a process that needs to go through, but it's quite draining yes. and you can forget about the progress of your business. Yeah. So that investment is very important. In, yeah. in terms of the gig economy, um, we, I mean, uh, I, I've used it um, to test new ideas, um, to quickly test, uh, to put something, a website up, quickly test a product, whether it's going to work or not, and shut it down if not. We've also used it at Merton Lawyers um, from a growth perspective. We, 
Um, I, I personally think just as a general overview, I think there's huge opportunities for people as well as business. Mm. I, I, I don't think it, 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 there are people as well that are trying to bridge work um, or grow their own businesses. And I think the gig economy does work on in that sense. Um, at Mertens, we um, start, over 18 months, we started with two people, we've now got 11. Um, and I would say that that flexibility in, we used a, for instance, we used a gig economy to put in place a CFO, um, just to initially get some of our financial strategy in place. Um, it wasn't very material, it wasn't very sophisticated, but at least we had opportunities to do certain work that could then give us an idea around our strategy because that was, wasn't yeah. a benefit of our, a, a strength of ours. Yeah. Um, but through that as well, that gave us that opportunity to grow quickly. It also gave her an opportunity who's to actually qualify a business for her. So she's gone from um, doing sporadic work for us to now generating four or five material clients um, as a CFO. Um, so from a, from a strategic professional perspective, it's yeah. been great. Yeah. Um, we've also been able to use it uh, to flesh out uh, certain professional services that we provide as well. So we as a law firm, there's a, very, a standard in, um, there's certain ways that people can go with a law firm is whether they specialise or whether they go for a broader um, buffet of services. Um, I choose a buffet. Um, but what we what we've been able to do as well is you know we have a corporate client come in they'll talk to us about specific issues they've got if a tax issue comes up generally it's difficult to employ full-time someone on a tax issue we don't want to lose that client to another mm. firm to answer those tax questions but we also want to service them yeah. um, so we've also been able to provide sporadic advice through the gig economy yeah. with people that can come in, provide that advice, get a solution for the client and, um, and go that way. And, and from there, again, that opportunity has come about. So, Awesome. And um, I think internationally, what have you seen sort of of interest in the whole gig economy? I know the UK have been quite big in um, a lot of the cases going through the courts in what's happening over there. So, But what have you seen perhaps in America? Or um, yeah, we, we just went over for, uh, well, not re in March, we went with Austrade and Invest Victoria, South by Southwest. And while I was going over, I went to New York to see family. And my cousin, he, um, he actually, he's part of this WAG app. I'm not sure if you've, I'm sure if everyone's, but it's where you can, he is it effectively can go and it's the Uber for working, for walking dogs. I love it. Mm. So he, and he, he comes back from college where he's upstate New York and then he comes in, he's got a job straight away and he yeah. makes so much money. <laughs> um, and it's great. And it's, it yeah. gives him a lot of purpose when he's back. He's not hanging around. He's not, yeah. but you know, for me, I worked, you know, at, at a Dan Murphy's and then yes. catering jobs and stuff. Yeah. And I've found them mm. to be quite good. It, it can be for him a little bit isolating. Okay. And I'd just be interested to see where these jobs end up yeah. down the track. Um, yeah. But that's, that's one example. The other example was actually, um, there's an article in Vanity Fair this month about the mini rooms that they're using in uh, television in the States. And previously, they would, TV studios would um, invest in a pilot very heavily mm. um, and risk everything. Now they've created these mini rooms where it's effectively they bring in, instead of one writer, they bring in five. Okay. And they put them on a contract for ten, two weeks, they write out a script, they flesh it out, and chances of it actually being successful is, is high. It is being taken advantage of, including from the industry, that people are getting paid lower wages, mm -hmm. um, which is being governed at the moment. But you know, if you've gone to LA, you'll see around bars, you'll talk to people that half of them are all actors and they're just wait or writers yeah. and waiting for that opportunity. And I think in this scenario, yes, there are parts where they're being taken advantage of, but there yeah. are also writers there getting that that foot in the door, which is, which is what they want. Yeah. So I think it's it's an interesting dynamic. It has to be governed well. Yes. Um, 
but I do see a lot of opportunity and I think it's, you know, it's going to be a lot yeah. more prevalent. And I like what you've sort of indicated there because I think that the gig economy from what we've observed has just been able to free up a lot of innovation. Um, you know, Legally Yours is very innovative what we're doing and, and I think it's, it's just, to me, that's extremely exciting that, you know, that like you say, it has to be tempered with, um, you know, making sure that it's not exploited for the wrong reasons, but certainly, you know, there's a lot... Um, a lot of good stuff coming out of it. So we might move on to Rob. Um, so Rob, I'll get you to um, grab the microphone. Oops, and then I'll pass it over. Um, so Rob, it'd be great if you could just talk a little bit more about those business models that we've sort of alluded to. So the different business models, but also the impact that the gig economy has had on traditional law firms as well. So a bit of info on that. Um, yeah, sure. So in relation to the, you know, when uh, Karen and I were talking about the gig economy, we've seen a, a fairly significant impact in our industry, and I think it's a good example of, you know, we talk about innovation and how technology's enabled uh, a lot of new business models. The way it's played out through legal is we, we've always had a guns for hire model in uh, the, uh, the, the barristers that work in our legal community. So these are specialists who you can employ on, a, uh, on an ad hoc basis, short term uh, gigs. Um, but what we've seen as, uh, as this you know, gig economy has become more prevalent is entire business models being, you know, being challenged, you know, Uber with the taxis in the legal space, it's big traditional law firms uh, being challenged by people doing things differently. And, you know, we've got, got a few of those people on the stage. But uh, there is, I think, a lot of upside um, in the, and it's not just the technology, it's the social attitudes as well and how uh, acceptable uh, it becomes to uh, you know, be employed on that basis, uh, how acceptable it becomes to engage employees uh, or contractors on a short-term uh, you know, uh, job-for-job basis. So uh, yeah, we, the way it's playing out in the, in the legal industry is really interesting. It's great to be in the middle of it and it'll be really interesting to see how things go in the future. I think you know, a couple of people have mentioned Uber as a, as a test case. They're obviously high profile. Um, they've been taken uh, to, to court a few times uh, in different jurisdictions and people look at them as a bit of a litmus test for uh, you know where the uh, you know where the um, uh, sorry the pendulum's going to fall with waiting to see yeah well one, one of the things that uh, Linda mentioned to uh, earlier in our discussion was uh, you know, we've got two categories at the moment. We've got employees and contractors, uh, and maybe the, that's the wrong model. Maybe there need to be more categories. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's plenty of areas where law is struggling to keep up with technology. This is just another one. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of um, leads on to... So certainly with the UK, they've now classified um, a third category, um, which they call the workers. Um, and in there, they're sort of dealing with it, I guess, from a perspective of saying, well, that kind of category, um, you know, doesn't receive the salaries, but they will be entitled to some of the benefits. So, say holiday pay, but not sick pay. So, you know, maybe that's kind of where um, it's going to fall. And and obviously, I mean, we've we've taken quite a positive um, stance um, at the moment on the gig economy. But certainly, um, and Linda, I'm sure we'll be able to talk a bit about the sort of the the, the negatives um, and some of the terrible cases that um, that you've had to to prosecute or had to go in and investigate. Um, but you know, obviously one of the things is you know there's a there's a concern out there that people will be paid lower wages um, certainly some of the reading I've done there was a concern around superannuation because obviously when that model came into fruition they didn't imagine this type of um, economy so we're going to end up with a whole heap of people that haven't um, got the superannuation that were predicted for them so you know what's going to happen in relation to that so I think that's a good segue into um, Linda having a bit of a chat. So, Lindo, I'll get you just to talk, and I'll move the microphone over, um, but just to talk about, yeah, from your perspective, what you've seen. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. And if I can just um, echo what Luke said at the very start about clarification of expectations and mutual obligations in, in any relationship that you have. The nature of what we do at the Ombudsman is we're often coming in after relationships have, have broken down. It's not a particularly a strength of Australian culture to have constructive, robust conversations. Sometimes we like to shy away from those and, and having the conversations early to set up what expectations are around your business arrangements 
arrangements and also the arrangements with people who are working with you, be it as employees and contractors, when everything's going well is really important because both for your future business and your staffing or working arrangements, you always need an exit strategy and having those conversations when you're all happy with each other is, uh, is much easier and cheaper generally as well. Um, so from the Ombudsman's perspective, um, we, we see many instances of really positive contracting and particularly if you're going from, you know, potentially a sole trader or individual corporation, if you like, to growing into being a micro business and then moving into being a, a small business as well, that contracting can provide a great opportunity for not only to deliver your own services, but also um, using Anthony's example, sort of in-source, I guess, if you like, temporarily uh, skills or particular um, support that you need at a given point in time and that's a really positive thing and there's, 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 there's nothing wrong with that and I think that's really important to call that out because when we can sometimes talk about contracting we can we can focus a bit on the, the downsides um, but there's most of the contracting that ha happens in Australia is a really po is a positive thing. Um, you know there are some instances obviously where there are exploitative practices which, which we see so the Fair Work Act which governs workplace relations in Australia provides sort of for two, two aspects primarily that look at contracting situations. One is what we call um, misclassification. So where someone, you know, people have said they're a contractor, but we look at it or others look at it and say, okay, well actually looking at the whole of the context, we actually think that they're indeed an employee. So someone makes a mistake effectively either through ignorance, um, not asking the right questions or just honestly making a mistake because on around the edges, this can be some a, a complex question. Um, so that's, that's one bucket and in terms of misclassification we will always work with businesses very proactively to assist them so that in terms of both understanding what their obligations are, hearing both sides of the story, trying to unpack it, um, we'll often look at arrangements and say well yes we are satisfied that they were contractors or we can't be satisfied that they were employees for example. Um, so misclassification are more the sort of the accidental types. It then moves into what the Act talks about in terms of sham contracting, which moves much more into the exploitative practices. And the way that um, it was talked about before about thinking about how you set up your business and what's going to be right for your business in terms of your staffing, and I use that term broadly, um, your staffing needs is really important um, and that they're also compliant. Where we see sham contracting is more where individuals or organisations sit down and they know exactly what an employee looks like, um, they know exactly what can't the, the certain obligations which come with that and then they set up practices deliberately to avoid that, knowing generally full well that the processes that they're putting in place and effectively they're building a fiction, if you like, that the person who's doing the work, the worker, is in fact an employee, but we're going to dress it up as something else. Um, and you can have a piece of paper that says, I could have a contract that says I'm a contractor, and at law that, that will be an indicator, but any court, and we will also as well, will look at the substance of the, re the reality of the arrangement in practice. So that's the important part of getting really good advice. Um, you might be tempted in some of these sorts of things to sort of work this sort of stuff out yourself, but if you are looking at growing your business, it's really important to get the foundations right. So if you do have a successful idea or a successful service that you're providing that you can scale up as your business grows and you've got the foundations right, otherwise it becomes a bit of a house of cards. So making decisions at the early stage around if someone is an employee or a contractor is uh, really important. In terms of the gig economy, there's you know there's quite a few you know common names that are in the press, obviously, and that we all know um, that predominantly use the smartphone phone technology, and that certainly shifted, I think, uh, the way that contractors can engage or workers can procure work. Um, in the past, you know, you maybe go to the supermarket and there might be a notice board, I'm showing my age here, but like a pin up for someone to help with a job. Whereas now you can put up on Airtasker, can you come over and help me lift my fridge in sort of two hours? And it's, it's just a really different frame. But I think it's really important to focus then on the substance of the relationship and not get distracted by the technology. The fact that the relationship between two people, be it a company or two humans, humans, if you like, um, is, you know, not to get distracted that just because it's on a smartphone and it's the gig, it's, it's okay and it's new and it's cool and that's okay. It's just, and it's not to say that it's wrong either, but you have to be thoughtful about these sorts of things. 
And there's a couple of benefits to this as well. So OH&S is obviously really important. You leave yourself personally and professionally exposed if you don't get that right. You also don't want your you know, valued employees to get injured. Um, if you're bringing people on board, you want to treat them properly, be that as a contractor or as an employee, because in some extent they're a representative of your business, your brand, either they're dealing with your customers or they're assisting you in building your business model. And if, if you're treating them poorly, or you're exploiting them, they're not going to be the best representatives that you would have hoped for. Um, there's a couple of other things that you should check as well in terms of workers around, you know, visa entitlements and if people have lawful rights to work as well. So there's there's heaps of checklists, for example, on our website, on the ATOs, the Australian Tax Office's website, and also on Work Cover here in Victoria, where you can go through and have a look at these checklists. But being really thoughtful about the characteristics is is important. There are so many more broader questions with respect to the gig economy and I know with Uber in New York it's been talked a lot about in the press about what regulatory response will there be and one of the considerations that New York is looking at beyond employment from an employment benefit perspective is congestion on the roads in New York being a significant issue and so having too many drivers on the road is that actually having a broader impact on the community and the society and infrastructure and the like so there's a lot of with these emerging economies I think it's really it's going to be fascinating as a community to see where where it develops and Australia has some really fundamental and strong protections in place. Um, we've got some good support networks and sources available to get advice and legally yours is a great example of that. Um, it's just the importance of reaching out early but to, and to try to do it lawfully. But if you make a mistake as well, again, just put your hand up and say you've made a mistake or get advice or contact us. You know, we don't, if someone comes in and says, hey, look, we made a mistake and it was honest and it was genuine and they came to us quickly, emphasis on quickly, um, you know, they're not going to end up in the bucket that I talked about earlier. So um, the challenge for us as a regulator is how do we, our job is to make sure Australian workplaces are, are cooperative, productive and harmonious. And, and part of that is supporting new ways of working, but whilst also making sure that we don't have people getting five or ten bucks an hour, mm. which some people are as well. And you look at some examples of the gig economy where you've got people on, you know, out at night in the pouring rain with no lights on, potentially on their, you know, on a bicycle. Um, they could be working under pressure. They um, for very little money. Um, and the, probably the bicycle couriers has a long history in Australia in terms of contracting. I won't bore you with the case law. I can leave the, the lawyers. I'm a reformed lawyer, so I can leave it to the other lawyers to explain the bicycle courier history way going way back when. Um, but it's it sort of, as a community, we also have an obligation to each other as well. And if you're wanting, if you are in the space where you've got a business, you're advising the business, you've got an entrepreneurial spirit in the first place, and you're wanting to grow your business or your client's business because it's, you know, it's a financial um, uh, contribution to yourself, but it's also much broader to the community. So let's make sure we treat people properly while we do that as well, and we don't um, we we don't have a situation where you've got people getting injured or being unprotected or being exploited um, because that, that that's not helpful for anyone in the community. Mm. Yeah, okay. I might I'll stretch it back. Yeah, before I do it. Um, so that's that's a really interesting point, and I think you know certainly from from what you've all spoken about, there's a real sort of um, temperance between you know not stifling innovation and allowing us to follow that entrepreneurial spirit and and do the business, but also from um, the people that are the working in the gig economy, you know, allowing them the freedom to work the way they want to work because you know we we probably haven't touched on that so much, but you know it actually opens up a lot of doors for people just like your um, cousin Anthony mm. to to do these certain and um, sort of more innovative jobs that you wouldn't even think that now he can earn cash from that and, and doing it from that way. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of positives, um, but it has to always be, you know, tempered with making sure that you know, I think that, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether we um, do end up creating this third class um, of, of worker or whether we have more classes so that we can keep up with this technology and those sorts of things. Um, and I guess the other point that I just wanted to make is that I, I know as a startup myself, is that you know there's so much stuff that we do at the beginning and we get so excited and get caught up in our passion um, and you know sometimes you know legal isn't um, the most exciting of areas and sometimes I mean I, I come across a lot of startups that sort of say oh 
just, you know, downloaded something from the internet for my T's and C's and thought I'd be okay or didn't really get into it and those sorts of things. And, um, you know, part of the reason why Legally Yours was created was specifically so that people could come. It, it didn't doesn't have to break the bank. Get the advice that you need. Get a fixed fee quote so you can budget for a lot of these things. So, you know, even with your employment contracts and all that kind of stuff, you can at least understand how much it's going to cost and then use that and factor in. But um, I, I guess I just wanted to throw out a question to the audience of how many of you are actually operating gig economies or working in the gig, gig economies? Is, is, who's, who's doing it? Have we got any show of hands? Yeah? Yeah? Fantastic. And so I'll probably open up the floor now unless the panel wanted to add anything to um, any questions that you might all have. No, actually, I want to ask a question. Yes. I have some questions with Heather. Yes, here, how about I give you this microphone? <laughs> they might be knowing me. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it. So it's a general question because uh, uh, Fair Work, I didn't see that Fair Work has something uh, to support for the, you know, startups. I don't know how you got supported. Uh, but actually I started the business in 2009 and uh, wound up in uh, 2017 after going into external administration in 2016. It was IT company. And, uh, you know, when I started in 2009, Fair Work started its job immediately because I had my office in uh, near North Melbourne office. So I started visiting and then uh, they wanted everything which a big business should give. I had hardly five, six, eight people working with me. And, you know, I was also working everybody, you know, as uh, uh, Luke said, there are different cultures in different kind of organizations. When we are very small, we just work as a family. That if somebody is not okay, you go home and then you can do it and whatever you, you deserve, you will get it. It's not a problem. Because then we work as a family. We don't work as a big organization because if it is big, I have worked in the organization like TCS, more than 300,000 people. So I know that in those organizations, we need different set of uh, rules, standards and the compliances. I, wo I worked in the Department of Compliance. I was the uh, manager for the compliance and the process improvement. I know all those things. And if see qualifications, I had multiple qualifications in engineering and IT, in management, banking, finance. Currently, I'm doing JD. Yeah. That will be my fifth master's. So, uh, so, uh, so I thought, OK, in 2009, when I came in 2008, uh, on getting my PI in 2003, first time I came in 99 in working in IT only and uh, did the implementation of GST in one of the retail chains. So I thought, okay, this time I should start something on my own when there was, it was taking time to get some good job. So I thought I have all those things, I should have started. But I, what kind of support I expected, uh, I don't know. I didn't know law or something, so I didn't get it. So when I was caught up in different things, then I just took admission to law as well. That okay, now let me know it. But it is my, you know, grudge, whatever you can say. But somehow I see little support to the budding businesses, startups, this way or that way. I have not seen it. I have not seen it. And uh, I want that at some stage I would, I would request or I would uh, give some advice to the government, to the parliament, to the leaders that they should support the entrepreneurship in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the Fair Work Ombudsman recently, in the last couple of months, launched a small business hub. As, as I mentioned, we take around half a million calls a year to our info line on 13 13 94, and fairwork.gov.au gets around, it's just over 16 million visits a year, around which eight, 8 million are unique visitors, which is pretty high given our population. Um, and we've set up a small business hub, which has all of the information that small businesses need to employ people um, properly. Um, so that includes includes template contracts um, for really basic stuff that includes pay slips, time and wages, record keeping, fact sheets. We've got an online learning centre which takes you through how to employ people properly, even how to hire people, you know, doing job design, deciding if they're a contract or not, how do you test if the person's telling the truth on the other side of their table, um, how do you onboard them, that sort of stuff, to try and give businesses the best sort of start. Um, we've also worked closely with a number of other government agencies, including the Australian Tax Office 
Office, um, ASIC, who are obviously responsible for company registration, and the Office of the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. And the federal government has a website called business.gov.au, which is like a business portal. And in addition to resources, you can also find information in terms of support if you're thinking about financial support or where grants, government grants, for example, where you can get support for um, setting up particular types of businesses or particular innovations. So government is working really hard to do that. Um, and you know we're, we're continuing to sort of innovate as we can sort of in that space. We've, we've released an app now that's um, called Record My Hours, which employees can use, but small businesses, it's popular with small businesses to get their employees to do it. So you can download our app and it uses geofencing and you punch in what your address is at work and you can set up multiple jobs as well if you're doing different casual jobs. And the phone records automatically when you're at the workplace and when you leave it. And it gives you prompts, for example, I don't know, let's say you work at a pub and you're there sort of after 18 hours. Okay, were you really there working the whole time? <laughs> or was that Friday night drinks as well? And so you can override that and it lets you export that to your boss too. You can just flick it on an email to your boss in terms of record keeping. So from a small business perspective, getting your staff involved in helping you is an important part of it because it's empowering them and you're also showing that you're not, you're not running away from what your obligations are to them and you're not scared about them keeping records of what hours that you're working. Um, there's a whole range of reasons why the record keeping is really important. Wages is just one of them. It feeds into insurance, you know, knowing when someone was actually there or when they weren't. Um, it also lets you assess um, the financial success and viability of the business in terms of effort and what you're actually paying um, in terms of running, running the business as well and the time of your staff as well. And I know it's not just the stuff that we have. There's a heap of other providers out there that have got some cool funky resources in, in this space and certainly I know that um, the rest of the panel would be able to support businesses in traversing this. So I think government can and rightly should get you started on the road but then you also the value of having a trusted advisor um, who knows your situation and knows your aspirations is really important as yeah, well. Can I say five more seconds? Yes. <laughs> oh sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not more because no, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually if uh, what happens when the law is not, not flexible for, as I said, for the startups or for the established companies, law should be different. If it is not uh, flexible, then what happens? A person like me, uh, the gig economy, those kind of things, I was practicing since 2009 because there were so many people, they liked it, otherwise who were not getting opportunities, I gave the opportunities and if they were not able to come to office. I gave them, okay, you can do from home. But at that time, I didn't have how to maintain those re records. Mm -hmm. so there's so many things. It's because say, when you work as a family, you don't write what your son is doing. Yeah. So can I just comment on that point? And it goes to my point earlier about relationships. Often when we hear relationships have gone wrong um, in the workplace, and obviously that's generally what we see from the compliance enforcement where things have gone wrong, is it's where relationships have been really positive and they have used familial language like that around, we felt like a member of the family, we didn't think it would be an issue, everything was going well, until it's not. Um, and that's why it's really important, I think, to take these steps sort of moving forward. And it's a level playing field as well, sort of in terms of startups, they're a really important part of the economy. But the business down the road that's been running has to, you know, bear the brunt. Yeah. So they have to see the face the consequences, yeah. as happened with me. Yeah. I yeah. more than yeah. 50 yeah. years, I don't have a house in Australia or anywhere in the world. Yeah. Though my kids, they're very good. They're working at in good level. But what I'm saying, it the entrepreneurs they suffer in my case it is a different story because i don't care so many generally most of them entrepreneurs they don't care whatever happens but i'm really happy to have a chat out of session yeah, yeah that's fine so what, what no no all good all good no thank you so yes question yes thank you question for linda i think it's for linda <laughs> linda startups have generally small teams of enthusiastic volunteers that are sharing their time, talents and expertise for potentially a future return on their investment, so to speak, or their labour. I wonder whether you may comment on that, please. And yeah, thanks. Thank you. 
Thanks. It intersects with another thing which is quite similar around interns, um, around our internships, which goes beyond sort of the, the, gig, the gig economy. And I don't need to ask people to put their hand up in their room to ask here who's done an unpaid internship to be pretty confident there'll be a few of you. Um, w when you have a business, the, the, what the law provides is that um, the business owner, be that the, the corporation or the shareholders, are the ones who reap the benefits and bear the risk. And that goes to both profitability and um, you know, financial loss and the like. So if it was a commercial operation and it was a business, uh, it would be hard for me to see how someone was volunteering their time to do that. Um, the way that the law is normally set up is that you, if I'm running the business and I've got people helping me, and this is putting not-for-profits to one side, sort of not-for-profit and religious organisations, we'll just pop them over there because they're in a different, uh, different um, there's different considerations there. But generally speaking, if people are doing work that um, the law would say that they should be entitled to be paid for, um, that you know, in the absence of that person doing that work, you would need to pay someone. In the absence of someone volunteering to do that work, you would need to pay someone to do that. Then they should be paid for that. Could you state what uh, uh, act that's in? The Fair Work Act. The Fair, the Fair Work Act, yes. And there's there's quite a lot of history going back at common law um, in various judgments over the years as well that sets that up. Um, now, this is different to if you're running, setting up a business together, and it might be in terms of how you frame the question. So if I'm going into business as a partnership with my buddies and I'm we're working together and it's part of the business set up, that could be different. But if I'm getting other people to come in to volunteer their time for down the track, so well, what then happens if the business does doesn't, doesn't take off as well. And that comes into the competitive, the even playing field of the competitive nature. So if I've got a cracking business idea or someone else is already doing it, I just think I can do it better. And I've set up my business and I've got a whole bunch of people who are really keen to volunteer their time. How is a business who's already doing it and it's established and paying people properly, how are they able to compete? around that. So I'm very happy to talk to you about that in more detail out of session. We've got a lot of information available on our website around some of this stuff, both internships, which some of the, um, the legal and factual considerations are very similar to what you're talking about, around what's in your, likely to be an internship versus employment. Mm. Um, and then, you know, if, if you were wanting to do that, that might be where you want to set up a um, be it a partnership arrangement. I'll leave that to the lawyers to advise you on. Like if you're wanting to go into b business with people and um, everybody put in sweat equity, effectively is what you're talking about, um, well then you need to set up a proper business structure to support that as well. Because again, it's all good until it's not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just in addition to that and that <coughs> sweat equity question, which I think comes up a lot in, in the startup space, um, you know, Linda mentioned earlier, Australians aren't really good at having those robust conversations early in the piece. Um, you really you really need to have those conversations and be clear about who's wearing what hat when because you know, there's lots of circumstances in a, uh, a startup where you might be uh, a shareholder, you might be a company director, you might also be an employee of the, uh, of the business and you might do different things in those different roles. And if you're not clear which hat <coughs> pardon me, you're wearing, um, then yeah, that, that's so... Uh, yeah, more uh, more fuel for the the confusion and uh, it can become problematic. Um, the other thing I just wanted to pick up on um, from Linda was that, that the idea that it's a two way street between the the contractor and the employee, so the contractor or the employee and the uh, the employer or the the head contractor. Um, the better communication you have, uh, the, the better the outcome. It's an investment in that relationship, and often uh, I think uh, you know companies are you know, want to want to skirt that conversation because they think it will be a difficult one, but I think it can demonstrate to uh, to the workers um, that you're in investing in the relationship and, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, goodwill that comes along with that. And like Linda said, compliance is a lot cheaper than, uh, you know, finding a, a rear guard action when, uh, when things go wrong. So. That's right. And if, if you don't want to have those conversations, that's when you can always, always go to a lawyer to have those conversations. <coughs> Um, so that you know they can actually get those conversations going. So, yeah. is there any more questions while we? Oh, yes, sorry. We'll take yeah. you. So, um, thanks. <coughs> thanks. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I'm interested in um, a an app company called uh, Melbourne Delivery Service. Um, they're like Uber Eats. They run. Um, they're quite big in the CBD here, and I've noticed um, they tend to employ a lot of. Um, of Chinese students or Chinese um, speakers, and 
Um, I was just wondering um, if whoever could speak um, perhaps on the impacts, positive or negative, that the, the app sector of the um, gig economy um, has the, had on uh, employment of minorities and international students and, <coughs> sorry, and maybe students as well. Yeah. Who would like to take that question? Anthony or Luke? Luke or Thornton? Uh, <laughs> I didn't quite get the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, the, what has it, I, I fleshed it out too much. Um, positive and negative impacts um, of employment of international students um, and minorities as well as students. Um, has there been positive, um, if so how, or negative impacts for, for employment? I don't know if I'm best to answer that one. I, I mean, I, I think just in general, like as a general comment, I think as long as they're being paid appropriately, there's good conditions around it, they've got the appropriate, you know, if they're... Sorry, this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Can someone get my guitar? Um, <laughs> But I think when, when it's been done appropriately, yeah. uh, I think that is a great positive. But unfortunately, there are many scenarios in history as well, and not just now, where um, they've been taken advantage of um, because they're probably coming from a, you know, into a society where they don't understand the, mm. the uh, protections that we have. And I think within Australia, we're very lucky to have these protections. And we, when we recently went to uh, America, we advise a lot of companies looking to invest in Australia and we went over there with the assumption thinking that we're going to be advising them on business structures and these really complicated areas of law but what they really wanted to understand was around the employment law here because um, we, we do have a very good structure and it's something that we can rely on and I think um, you know, it's something to be, to be very, to have that to have a sense of security. Yeah, and, so, and sorry, I can add, and, and I, I see it in, in the horticulture sector sector a lot. Mm. Um, I do a lot of work with farmers and uh, and uh, who produce uh, for the big supermarkets, mm -hmm. and uh, we see a lot of, uh, not so much now, but um, exploitation of, of uh, overseas workers, but that's certainly been tightened up with a lot of regulation, and thanks to the Fair Work Ombudsman actually in that area mm. too. So. Um, but you hope it's not happening and that people are chosen and, and picked on their merits. But it, it, there is exploitation out there, mm. but it is being uh, heavily policed now. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, if I can just add, sort of like workforce participation is, is as long, presuming people have work rights, workforce, workforce participation has so many benefits to people who are here, particularly on visas, as, as I said, if they have work rights, um, both from a community being welcomed into the community in a really positive way, um, which is, I think, the challenge with your, your, your relative as well. Like, are they going to build workplace relations if they're just walking dogs all the time and stuff? Although the dogs probably sometimes are easier. Yeah, good friends with dogs. Um, one thing that we see at the Ombudsman too around the really the pointy edge I guess of exploitation is around some co-cultural exploitation within communities as well. Mm. So people coming in on visas, um, often in, on international student visas, being employed by members of their own community and being exploited. So we're doing a lot of work um, specifically in individual communities on that, in, la in language materials, working with community organisations, both within Australia and at home before people come to Australia so that they're informed about what their, what their rights are, um, because I think that's really, that's really critical because we want, we want people to come to Australia and be treated fairly. We want people to be proud of their experience here. We don't want people going home and having been treated poorly or taken dis um, taken advantage of that's not that's not what Australia is all about it's, that's that, that goes against all of Australians um, values and our, the way that the laws are set up as well um, but it remains an ongoing challenge so it's a, just a shout out we have a um, anonymous report available on our website at fairwork.gov.au um, I understand that people making complaints about what's happening in their workplace can be hard for a whole range of reasons but you can actually jump on there and lodge an anonymous report if you've got a particular concern about an organisation, a friend or a friend, if you think someone's getting treated poorly. Um, and we analyse all of those reports and then um, you use them to, for intelligence-based um, compliance activities as well. So 
it's a really it's a really good question because it's um, it's a challenge that we all have to make sure that people have a positive experience in the workplace. Um, well, yeah, sorry. Yep, um, I work in a Series B. Sorry, I can do it. No, actually, you're good. Yeah. I work at a Series B startup right now, and among a number of other products, we're looking to invest in a product using the gig economy. Um, obviously, as you can all appreciate, it's a bit disheartening or dismaying when regulation is trying to catch up because the private industry is obviously investing a lot now. So I was looking at across the panel what predictions you all had with how regulation is going to try and catch up to this um, in the future. Um, my, I hope, and what I predict, I, I was actually just thinking about this before, um, I do hope that regulation innovates a bit around this space and actually comes up with a solution that uh, allows um, companies to, to leverage off this gig economy, but then also not only just the, the business, but also the individual is also um, is, is benefiting from it. So I think, you know, we spoke tonight about that there's going to be um, potentially another definition of an employer contractor. I mean, that discussion's being had. I'm, I, I, I can't see in the future, but I haven't got a you know, crystal ball, but I, I would anticipate something like that might come down the pipe, but mm. I don't want to yeah, also... Yeah, uh, and I think, in, and just to be really clear, particularly for the viral aspect of Facebook as well, is, um, you know, that the, the law is as it stands at the moment in Australia, so there's an employee and there's a contractor. There are discussions going on, I think, in the community, and we're seeing from jurisdictions overseas and the like about is there some other is there some other category? Um, perhaps yes and perhaps, perhaps not. That'll be a conversation that Australia will need to have as a community, and it goes much more broadly too than only in terms of workplace... Um, relations, um, as Karen sort of flagged with superannuation, you know, if people um, if if people are not categorised as employees who ordinarily would be, what happens when they retire, and who and who pays for their retirement, um, who pays um, for the um, you know the the roads and infrastructure and things in the meantime if there's a decrease in revenue, but is that offset by the innovation and things from businesses going well and developing? None of these are none of these are easy easy questions at all, um, but I. I I think it's certainly a watch this space area would be my prediction. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we can, you know, we, we can know in terms of where the law will go, but my, my prediction is the law will, will change and will innovate. The bigger question is, you know, how quickly, and I suspect it will change pretty slowly um, because the legislative process is, is slow. And I think, you know, we, we saw the example with uh, Uber coming in, uh, you know, setting up a business in a grey area and uh, but that that was a, a massive achievement in a sense, and a bit of a uh, a bit of an anomaly. You know, it was really just the, the scale of that that enabled them to make the impact that they made. I think, but yeah, I think the law will change uh, quite slowly. And um, yeah, if your investment requires uh, a change in law, then um, you know there's uh, yeah, other panels you need to be speaking to. Mm -hmm. Is the power to make workplace law delegated to? Uh, no, 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 no. The Australian <laughs> Parliament, yeah, no. So our, um, our our job is to educate and um, and investigate if we think there's been non-compliance, and then ultimately, if we think there's been non-compliance, we've got some statutory instruments that we can use, such as compliance notices and the like, and infringement notices. But generally, it goes before a court. So we ourselves, accepting infringement notices, don't. Um, Impose pines. We recently filed proceedings uh, in the federal court against Fedora um, with allegations that three riders had been um, were engaged in our view were employees and were not in fact contractors, as Fedora asserted. Um, those proceedings aren't continuing now, given the restrictions under the Corporations Act that um, Fedora is in administration, um, so those proceedings can't go ahead now. Um, but that's just, I guess, and there's an example of one of the things we were looking to do was to, um, you know, our view and our assessment was for those three riders, and this is where it's case specific, for those three riders that our view was, we were putting to the court that our view, we were alleging that they were um, they were um, actually workers as a, employees as opposed to contractors, yeah. We've probably only got time for one more question, so I, I might actually yeah, get you to ask. I can summarise. Yeah. Um, just want uh, a view on educators in the vocational education training space. Okay. Um, educating at multiple providers as a contractor. Uh, 
Okay, so the question just for our Facebook Live people is around um, the education um, vocational area and yeah, the contracting and that. So who would like to? I heard a bit of a nod from one of you, which he wants to take up. Um, no, look, I, I actually don't know that much about it, but I know a friend of mine is, we're, we're going through an acquisition at the moment of a labour hire um, company in the aged care space. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's one, I don't, I, I honestly don't know what the, what the answer is to that, but it, it is coming up. Yeah. Um, it has been because of that flexibility that yeah. they've got and that, and, and there, it is a very grey, not a grey area, but it's, it's something that you really have to get your hands dirty in. On. Towards. I mean, there's there's it's, pest yeah. stacks of examples, and there might well be an education one, mm. but the the same tests are applied, and that's some of the friction that's occurring now. Is the courts and tribunals. Uh, frustrated about about the the tests that have been around since the 20s 30s uh, and not keeping up to date with our our modes of operation so um, to answer your question yet yeah, there probably is I'm not off the top of my head aware of one but there will be um, but you'll find in every case the same types of tests are applied the the multi-facet test uh, control uh, so they're the types of tests that are applied over and over um, and even recently on Uber, um, and they were applied in Uber's, Uber's yeah. favour. Can I just point out, um, and if you're in startups and uh, in this gig economy, you should read, sorry, you should read, uh, it's a Senate inquiry into uh, corporate avoidance of the Fair Work Act. Um, you'll get it off, just Google it, you'll find it, and it's really, really uh, informative on, uh, and there's a number of submissions by unions, um, by uh, a number of gig economy uh, companies. So it's really, really handy to read. So I um, really encourage you to read that document. Can I was going to. Repeat that again. So it's it's the Senate inquiry. I've got it written here. The Senate inquiry into corporate avoidance of the Fair Work Act, and the report date is 6 September 2017. So if you Google that, have a read of it. It'll really bring you up to speed. Uh, and there's some recommendations in that inquiry as to how the Fair Work Act should be amended. So it's a really handy document to read. Um, and I, just to pick up on Luke's point too, it's not that we're without any guidance in this space. In addition to what the Fair Work Act provides, there is a well-established common law test around the multi-factor test and the control test. There's a, around 10 or so different factors that you can look at. The one I usually like to jump to straight away because it can be quite sobering, it can shorten the conversation, is would you be happy if that person got their buddy to do the job instead of them doing it for you? Um, can often be a good test as to whether or not so if it's if the answer to that is no that's usually more of a tick towards the employee side of things as well but there's a whole range of things like control goes to uniforms ability to delegate um, autonomy and a whole range of things is it a time-based task or is it you know contract um, contract constructed in a different way as well so and there's a heap of information available online um, about that as well and I think in summary for, for the gig economies and, and for startups uh, is is trying if I can if I can say it in a few words try and uh, look to see whether your business and I think it can be particularly in this in this space driven towards projects and tasks rather than hours driven and requiring staff to be in the office because one of the big tests is control and the control you have over your staff uniforms times they need to be in the office uh, telling them how to go about things if you just tell them you want that task done. Um, go about it how you wish, but that's the that's the end product that I want. Um, you will you will find that you will um, be further away from um, an employment relationship being found. So, and I think that moulds well for the gig economy, uh, in that you want that task done, and that you're a specialist in that. You that's why I brought you on board, and that'll help protect you. Stay away from the traditional uniform hours of work, punch in, punch out. But I think those types of scenarios and are fading anyway and as we move into this new type of doing it. Yeah, yeah. even I think why there could be only if more than one person then they are the contractor. Even yeah. one person could be a contractor. Yeah. If it's just one person he cannot delegate. Yeah. 
Look, thank you. I know there are lots more questions to come, so we will actually stay behind um, and you can attack our panellists um, when we go <laughs> offline. Um, so absolutely say. So I just want to thank you all for coming. I think, you know, from certainly from what I take away from the discussion that we've had is that, you know, there's um, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of, you know, potential re regulation coming. There are things that we need to watch out for. Um, but, you know, probably what I would say to you is, you know, seek legal advice at the earliest time possible. Um, as you can see from the lawyers we have here, they're not scary. Um, they talk down to earth. They will want to get to know your business. And you know, from what Linda said um, at the beginning as well, it's you can't afford not to. So you know, get that get that advice. Um, Obviously, we have the quick match and we have the fixed fee quote because you know we're here to help you with that. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly go to legallyyours.com.au and you can find all our lawyers um, listed on that platform um, for those features. And I uh, just want to do a shout out. We partnered with Asia Law Network, which is Asia's largest legal network of lawyers, and they're all watching tonight. So thank you to them. Thank you to WeWork, who have um, let us have their space and drink all of their beer on tap. So we love being at WeWork here. Um, and just to all let you know, we'll put some of these resources on our website. So if you head to our blog page, which is you can get either from our platform at blog.legallyyours.com.au and we'll actually put a bit of a summary of what everyone said. We'll have their names there. We'll, we'll put that article on there too so that you've got those resources. And you know, another really big thing about Legally Yours is we're really passionate about free education um, because we think you make the potential client more empowered, the more likely you will be to use the legal service. So um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you to our panellists. I do have a little gift over there, so don't run. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice little clap. And as I said, thank you to all those that have watched um, live tonight. But yes, feel free to keep your questions coming. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, well done.